Jesus Christ be praised. Our, our worship today is for Holy Trinity Sunday. Here are some things regarding Holy Trinity Sunday. Uh, it is the Sunday of celebrating that God has revealed himself as one God, and he has done so in three persons. And so we celebrate the uh, co-equal majesty of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our one God. The uh, tradition for Holy Trinity is to confess the Athanasian Creed. You may wish to uh, bookmark, especially page 319, page 319 in your hymnal, so that when we come to the Athanasian Creed, you will be ready. For those gathered here, uh, we appreciate that uh, as we are gathered with 10 or less, according to our mayor's uh, order, that um, you would please respond with full voice as we worship. And uh, the reason behind that is so that you will be in ministry to all of those whom we welcome this morning on the internet and uh, uh, that they will hear your voices. I ask for two things. One is the fullness of your voice. And secondly, as you do it, listen to the others around you to make sure that you are responding together. I've noticed sometimes when we do it, everyone says, oh, we want to be in fullness of voice. But up here, everyone's doing things at a different time. One of the things we don't always understand, but, but that when you think about it, you do, is that the responses of the liturgy unify us. That is, when we, when I say a verse, that's the first half of a verse, and you respond, that unifies us in being together in that verse. And when the voices of the people come together in all of the things that the congregation speaks, it is a way of saying we're one in our Lord Jesus Christ. We invite everyone who is here to uh, 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 sign up for Wednesday in the Word, which is now Thursday in the Word. Uh, Thursday in the Word because we're having Wednesday night service for the foreseeable future, also a service of Holy Communion. We want that everyone who is a communicant at Martini Lutheran Church would be receiving communion during these weeks. It's been a drought. It's been a while since Holy Communion uh, was celebrated at the beginning of March. And now we are thankful that different people are signing up for these services and uh, taking part in the word and in the sacrament in this way. If you've not done so yet, we encourage you, please call the office and Cricket will get back to you uh, to schedule you in as, uh, as immediately as possible. If you, don't, if you don't telephone, please uh, write her at secretary at martinilutheran.org. That's secretary at martinilutheran.org. Some of you are saying we wish there were ways to serve uh, during this time. We know there are people who were not able to get out and get food, that sort of thing. Uh, both here at church and uh, also over near St. Thomas Lutheran Church, our sister church, uh, are opportunities to take food to neighbors, uh, or to sort some food here and present it actually outside on our parking lot um, for the sake, uh, keeping with all the CDC guidelines, for the sake of keeping families fed. If you have any interest in serving that way, you may not get food out of it, but it will go to those for whom it's designated, and you will be able to do so uh, because of what Christ has done for you. Uh, you wish to reflect that in the lives of others, so see me about that if you like. Um, I believe those are all the, oh, I, I need to say this because our mayor did speak uh, at one o'clock Friday. Uh, it was a hope that the indoor attendance would, might be raised, and uh, here in Baltimore City, that's simply not the case. Uh, we are still bound to 10 or less, including the pastor, the organist, the streamer, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're glad to get together, and friends, please simply enjoy this fellowship today. Uh, there is the possibility, uh, however, and this is a new thing as of his speech, uh, to have an outdoor service of 50 or less. Uh, we are considering that. There are some questions of weather and of logistics for sound, etc. But it would be great to be able to reunite in a service of the word outside. And uh, still, we would continue our 11 o'clock service unbroken. So uh, if we do so, it will not be next week, but it could be the week after, depending on what the lay ministers may offer uh, as their best thoughts as well. So we pray God's blessing upon your worship, and uh, we look forward uh, to being together as we open with a great hymn of the Trinity, hymn 940, Holy God, we praise your name.
We ask those who are able to stand, please to stand. If you're not, we understand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We rise to praise God using Psalm 8 responsively. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, will be forever. Amen. to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, a heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord, Thou only O Christ, 
with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now and forever. We are seated. Our catechism uh, found today on 322 is the uh, close of the commandments. And so we ask, what does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. Our first reading for this Sunday of the Holy Trinity uh, is the entire first chapter of Genesis plus the first four verses, uh, Genesis 1 uh, plus the first four verses of Genesis 2, uh, the, the uh, account of creation. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good, and God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which was their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there, were evening and, uh, there was evening and there was morning, a uh, fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, 
Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with its seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Our second reading from the second chapter of Acts, uh, beginning with the first half of the 14th verse. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness in your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, and that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel forming the basis of our sermon today from the 28th chapter of Matthew, beginning of the 16th verse. Glory be to thee, O Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Our creed today, the Athanasian Creed, found on page 319 in the front of your hymnal, addresses uh, specifically two mysteries uh, of God. One is that he is one God and three co-equal persons, and then the other that Jesus, one of those persons of God, the Son of God, one of those persons, is both God and man in one reasonable flesh. And so we confess this faith by tradition once a year here on Holy Trinity Sunday. We do so together. Whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinities, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or Lord. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal. So that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and the unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, comprised of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by the confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, 
So God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Friends, you may be seated, and our sermon hymn is hymn 507, Holy, Holy, Holy. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the entire gospel, and because it's short, we're going to read it. Refresh ourselves here. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and they saw him and worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Here ends the reading of our text, and you may be seated. Friends, in our Lord Jesus Christ, this short gospel, long text, short gospel, provides us with two items that just take an extra moment to take in. 
Uh, one is maybe because we don't always read verse 17 when we read the later verses of the Great Commission, is that some doubted. It's only days before he's going to ascend to heaven, and we still have some doubting, but it says. And they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then the other is the teaching of the Trinity, the second thing which is difficult to take into our minds. Indeed, both of these, while sometimes troublesome to the mind, uh, can show us that the Holy Scripture, first of all, is not a contrivance of human beings. After all, if Scripture were a mere contrivance of those who got together, whether in a big room once or whether across centuries and preened it for each other and tried to make it say things, well, then certain things would not have the ring of truth. But God, in his wisdom, not only inspires the individual writers and gives them agreement across the ages, each according to their own context, each according to the specific words God has given them and the mission that he has, on which he has sent them. Well, God is willing to entrust us with these difficulties. He's willing to entrust us with the idea that some disciples doubted the resurrected Christ. And also he's willing to entrust us with the mystery that we have one God who is three persons and bear one name. I want to say something about the doubters, and then I want to say something about the Trinity, and then I'd like to preach through these verses which include the Great Commission. The doubters. Friends, you may recall that there was a time when Jesus had been at the Mount of Transfiguration, and when he came down, uh, there was a great dispute among the disciples. They tried to heal somebody, they couldn't. And in the end, when Jesus asked the father of the person to be healed, um, you know, um, all things are possible to those who believe, he says. And the man says to him, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. All of us walk around with certain times where we doubt, where we question. It doesn't make doubt particularly good, although God will take doubt and use it for a good function that we may grow closer to him, that we may seek him and perhaps find him in an even richer way. I must ask you, if you were one of the twelve, now the eleven because Judas is gone, if you were one of these, when you saw Jesus risen from the dead, might not you also have doubted for this reason? You saw him die an agonizing death. Everything in you, you who had likely seen others pass away in your lifetime, when you saw how he died, you knew he wasn't coming back. Or so everything human told you. Yes, indeed, Jesus had told the disciples at least three times he would be crucified and rise again, but at this point, it would be natural. It would be true to the natural human mind to say, oh, this is just so hard to take in. Maybe the doubting wasn't even that you doubted he was standing there. But when we get overloaded with so many things at once, then all at once we find that everything is a little harder to process and takes a little longer. And for your sake and for theirs, I would say to you, Jesus did not ascend at that moment. Maybe he knew they needed a little more time. God is indeed patient with his people and shows that over and over in Scripture. And so the Lord needs to get them through a period where they are still up in the air, where there may be general doubt or specific doubt so that they can get to a better place of fuller trust and of a sense that, again, God has done all things well. The second thing that may be hard, but that once we put it into life, we understand it, much like the doubting part, is the teaching of the Trinity. And the Trinity is taught here because there is only one name named, baptizing in the name. But then it says, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we're shown that just as Jesus began his public ministry, with the uh, uh, Holy Trinity bearing witness to the world where he was baptized and the Father spoke the words of affirmation and the Holy Spirit marked him out and came down on him in the form of a dove. So it is that the Trinity begins and ends, if you will, Jesus' public ministry. But we will say this, that that too gives us that ring of truth that says, yes, these are things that if people just wanted you to like this all and believe, why trouble your poor mind, you know? But God trusts you with your mind, the mind he gave you. And he trusts you in this way, that if he is to be knowable, he must tell you about himself. That's how you get to know someone. But if he is to be God, there will always be facets and dimensions of God that will be unknowable. That we'll just scratch our heads and say, well, okay, if you say so. 
And that's where it comes down to us for this. We searched our Bibles and we looked. And as we looked at our Bibles from Genesis to Revelation, we found that there was truly one God and that God always called himself as such. And then as we searched our Bibles from Genesis to Revelation, we saw three distinct persons, all of whom were referred to as God, all of whom received worship, all of whom were put together, actually, all three. Had we found four, we would believe today a quadernity. Had we found two, we would believe a duality. But we don't believe Trinity because someone made up the word and put it forth. We believe it because it's a word we had to make up, very easily to say that there is one God, the unity of Trinity, and there are three persons, the tripart, triunity, Trinity. So we should find comfort in this thing we also don't understand, and that God has both sought to make himself known, and then sought to make himself known to the point that you will be so filled with him and the thoughts of him that it will go beyond your ability and show he has yet more ability. Verse 17, uh, some doubted. Verse 20, the teaching of the Trinity. Uh, sorry, 19. In each case, it's not because we understand it that we believe it. And that's why we sometimes say here that relationship is a way of knowing. Because in relationship, you get to learn more about life you get to learn more about yourself, even in ways that you cannot cognitively put forth. Faith is that relationship which God gave you, and it's another way of knowing. We believe it because the Bible is this. He looked down, he said, those boys and girls will never figure this out if I don't tell them. So he had holy prophets and others write these things down so that we would know. He wanted to make sure, he said, those boys and girls won't they just won't keep track on things. They'll put the, the spotlight on themselves or they'll talk about how they can find a way through some recipe of works to get to heaven. So we'll have the Bible written so that everything always points to Christ. And that way, when they go to the Bible to search for things, if they take any time at all, they'll start being pointed to Christ again. And it'll work great that way. Today, because of the teaching of the Trinity, we say this as the theme of the remaining part of our sermon, that the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, including the incarnate and glorified Christ, is interested in creating believers from non-believers. The entire Godhead is interested in creating believers from unbelievers. Some of us may have been had it brought to mind, and I hope that as a nation we always do, uh, that yesterday was D-Day, it was Normandy Beach Day. It was the day when there were large amounts of men going to sacrifice their lives so that there might be, in a place where it held in tyranny, liberty brought. And for every square foot and then square mile that they could win back, liberty was reestablished until, in the whole process of things, it would be won. In the same way, this is how God is interested in creating believers from non-believers. He gives a call to action. He says, go. Go. Please don't leave. Go. And the reason for go is because when we see the Great Commission given, we start with make disciples in our minds. But he starts with go. You've got a job to do. You have a purpose for every Christian believing that they live a purposeless life, they missed a little two-letter word called go. The Lord is sending you. He's sending you to make a difference. And as he says go, we're like those who are going forward into a place of tyranny to see more square feet, square miles, and eternal souls set free. That's why we chafe under being ten and only ten here. It's why we chafe under the fact that even if we invite friends to come, they're too scared of the virus to show up. And in my opinion, church has been demonized beyond such things as Walmart and Home Depot where it's perfectly okay to go. As though somehow this is a place of horrid disease and everyone here wants to kill each other and go out and kill the world with a virus. This is a wonderful place. And right now we bear under suffering. But as we bear under suffering, our prayers are heard by God, and we do see some movement, although in some jurisdictions far slower than others. Go! 
And part of going is to bring them in. When we do our outdoor service, there will be a chance to do that some. We're hoping for just in a few weeks, we'll see. Then he says, make disciples. Make a people for God who formerly did not know him. Friends, if you were a disciple of Jesus, one thing is true about you. There was a time when you were not his disciple. There was a time when you did not know him and where he made you his disciples. For him saying to these, go make disciples, they were instrumental. They were the immediate cause of being made disciples. What truly made you a disciple is that Jesus came to you through someone. Maybe through your parents who had you baptized. Maybe through some spiritual parent who told you about Jesus and then you desired, desired baptism. In all of those ways, there was a time you were not born in sin, unable to save yourself. And there is a time today that you are because someone made disciples, ultimately God. But for each of you, it happened through someone. And if you think on how you are brought here, you can think of one or more people that are the reason that you are a believer today. So these went and made disciples. And then he said what to do. He gave two ways, a twofold way. These are weapons of spiritual war. You see, the weapons of D-Day war and other wars that are fought are many and they're lethal. But they need to do that. And at times, because people are certainly killed in battle, judgment day comes from those lethal weapons, in a sense, as to who's going to win or lose that war. In the weapons of spiritual warfare, they are also many, and they are life-giving. They are many, and they're life-giving, even as they are lethal by putting to death the wiles of the evil foe. He's judged, and the deed is done for him, and the day will come when all know where he is going, and he knows he's going. But for all others, the weapons of the Spirit set you free. The weapons of the Spirit give you life. Grace is given through them. And the blood of Christ is applied to you and sets you free and forgiven, washed clean. Truly life-giving not only for a good life here, but for eternal life, beginning at the time that you are made that disciple. And so baptism is one of those weapons of the Spirit. Go and make disciples baptizing. And when you're baptized, you're always baptized into something. There are times where people will ask me, Pastor, you know, I'm, I, I used to be Roman Catholic and I'm thinking of joining the church. Do I have to be rebaptized a Lutheran? We take a look at our Bible, which is what Lutherans like to do. And as we look at our Bible, we see the baptism should be in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we ask them, are you baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Is your church a church that believes these three to be truly God and the persons of God? Well, yes. Well, then your baptism is our baptism. And we are one in Christ. And so we welcome a person in because the weapons of the Spirit have already been at work and now are finding a fuller work if they have lapsed or have in some way fallen away and now are returning. We rebaptize certain others. For instance, um, those who do not believe the Trinity. If your church says Unitarian, you are not Trinitarian. So we rebaptize if you have been baptized. Uh, there's a uh, second largest Pentecostal group, the United Pentecostal Church. Uh, they subordinate the members of the Trinity in an unscriptural way. We disallow that and we baptize. Somebody says, well, pastor, you know, they call themselves Christian. What if you're wrong? Well, I'd rather be wrong and have baptized the person than to be uh, a wrong in not baptizing them and finding that they went facing God unbaptized since God always links baptism and faith together, never separates them. They may come in either order, here baptizing and then teaching, but they must be together. They are God's way. They are God's weapons of the Spirit that kill the sinful self and bring forth a new redeemed child of God. Well, anyway, you're baptized into a belief. That's the point. And so what you're baptized into is what marks you. It's who you are. It's how you'll really be acting this week based on that, if you are a child of your baptism. And then, of course, that's that relationship which helps us know life, but also teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. 
There's two things, two objects uh, of the teaching, is, if you will. Uh, the, the main object is to observe, but the point is, it's to observe what? All that I've commanded you. It's hard to observe all that he commanded us in any single week or in a lifetime. All that he commanded us. But let's take this down and distill it. In our catechism time, when we speak of the Ten Commandments, we see them not only as law, but as a way of living for Jesus in the joy of the gospel. We see it as a way of saying, well, if I shouldn't murder, then how may I simply make life the best? How may I respect and love life and each one? If I shouldn't steal, well, how may I respect others' property? How may I have an understanding that God has given them certain things and certain gifts? How may I maybe add to someone else's property if they are without? So with the commandments on marriage, on truth-telling, and even on the desires of your heart. It's not just, don't do this, do this. But it's, wow, I've been open now as a child of God to take these things in their most positive way and to apply Jesus and his love which he gave me and make that blessing go to others. And so teaching all things that I have commanded you, to observe all things I've commanded you. But Jesus made it even simpler. Jesus, when he was speaking, summarized the commandments this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest first commandment, he says in Matthew 22. And a second is like it, he continues. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments of love are indeed what the baptized person finds, that if you knew nothing in specific codified form, but you had a heart of love that was informed with the love of Jesus, you would find yourself keeping every one of those commandments continually. Baptizing and teaching are nothing, nothing else but the cross, are they? They're nothing else but the cross. Because when you are baptized into the message of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you were baptized into what he was doing in the world for you. The blood of Jesus, this is the reason baptism saves. According to St. Peter, baptism now saves you. Well, why? Well, because it is God acting to apply the blood shed by Jesus to you personally. You're called by name, and that blood and righteousness is applied to you by God. And you are marked. It's an invisible tattoo, meaning it never wears out. And so it is that our baptism takes care of bringing the cross to us. And in teaching, we've already said, if you truly understand this book that God gave, he wrote it centered on Jesus. So when you start reading it, suddenly you're centered on Jesus. And the central part of Jesus' act in the whole world was to be suspended between earth and heaven, taking your sins upon him and making a priestly offering of himself, sacrificing his blood. So that as you stood on earth and looked to your heavenly father, there from earth was pointed a sacrifice to heaven that would forgive your sins and cleanse from all each day. There is no great commission. There is no work of the entire Godhead without the cross of Jesus Christ being central. And so the Godhead, the entire Godhead, is involved in bringing you to him and in your bringing others to him. And so you know your status. The Father sent Jesus, his Son. Jesus gave himself, his whole self, for you. And he sent the Holy Spirit, whose job was to bring Christ to you and to bring you to Christ over and over again in confession, in praise, in all prayer, and in the hearing of the word. So you find your life in every way to look like the cross because of the Trinity. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that and then we'll close. In baptism, we look at something God created early on and used as the early on way in a Christian's life. Water. He's the creator of water. He's the author of the word. And so that is in baptism, the work of the father comes to you. The son is the one by whom all things were made. When we read Genesis 1 this morning, we read of all three members of the Trinity, even though one is not specifically named, because it is in John chapter 1 we are told that it is this word of God, Jesus Christ, by whom all things were made. And so the Father creates, the Son creates. Where was the Holy Spirit? Oh, that's right. He was moving over the waters, you see. 
And so there seems to be both agency and presence and cooperation within God for the creation. So the son by whom all things were made, the son who called himself the truth, the son who called himself the living water, the son who, when he was the giver of life, made sure that he was the giver of baptism, that that life may be applied. And so when you are baptized, not only did the father work for you, the son worked for you. The Holy Spirit who moved over the waters is with you because Jesus spoke when he talked to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and spoke of being born of water and the Spirit. The grammar of that I don't want to major in, but the only way to understand that is born of, and then the object is the compound object of water and the Spirit. They are unseparated in Jesus' way of speaking to Nicodemus. You are born of water and the Spirit. And so God's Holy Spirit came to you that day. And in the teaching, well, your Heavenly Father teaches you in all of life if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Your Heavenly Father is to you loving as a father and strong as a father. And as a father, he may discipline his children, but he's not punishing you for your sins. He is disciplining you for love, that you may look to him and be strong in him. And he is compared by Jesus in John 8... He is compared as, the ad, as, as against the adversary who is called the father. Satan is called the father of lies. Jesus says he's a liar and the father of lies. So you either have the father of truth or the father of lies. The father of truth teaches. The father of lies only wishes to wreak chaos and havoc, but has no order, no truth to present. Jesus, as that living water, is your teacher we read how he taught with authority and that he as living water, he said to the woman at the well, will have within him a water that wells up into eternal life. So he is constantly refreshing your soul as the living water. And we are taught in him and that teaching refreshes. And we are baptized, as we mentioned, into his gospel. And the Holy Spirit, well, that's clear. Jesus said when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He will take what is mine, Jesus says, and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, and therefore I said, he will take what is mine and give to you. Do you see all three persons of God once again in your daily life working for you? And so the whole Godhead cares for you and is hard at work for you. God, the Holy Spirit, sends pastors where pastors should be sent, and he sends you where you should be sent. And in the doing, the word of the Lord grows. Jesus finally finishes it all up with a promise, doesn't he? Behold, I'm with you always. Somebody, where's, where's God? Where's God in all this? He's there. He promised he would be. He's carried out every promise so far. If you have a day that promise is hard to see or, or to, to make sure of by your own evidence, so be it. God has a track record that's worthy of believing. I'm with you always. I'm with you always to the end of the age. I'm with you always that if the world should end, I'll be there and I'll be there for you. And when your life should end, I'll be there and I'll be there for you. This week, when you hit your first big challenge, I want you to go with a sense of motivation. When you see a challenge and it stops you, one of those challenges, and you have to take a breath for a bit and you have to think, I want you to be able to think these thoughts. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is interested in me. I didn't deserve that. It's amazing that all of God should be interested in one individual. But it's been shown us in Christ and in Christ applied to you in belief and baptism. And so I want you to say it. Say it for whoever will hear it. Say it inside yourself if that's the better way. Say so that God hears it and receives it as praise. And say it so that the demons hear it and tremble. But the fact of the matter is, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is interested in me. Yes, the whole God is interested in you. Father sent Christ. Christ sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to you. And now the Holy Spirit sends you so that yet one more person that crosses your path this week, will one day also be able to affirm, Almighty God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was interested in me. Amen. And so, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Friends, we have just in song given our hearts and spirit to our dear Lord in response to his word. This would normally be a time for offering, and at this time we do not receive offering during the church service. There is a receptacle in the back if you wish to make use for it, and also for those of you who wish to give by uh, giving online, or if you have indeed taken up a regular giving, which automatically is taken care, we encourage you to that too. Those of you who are at home, if this is a time for doing that, God bless you in the doing, and uh, we also appreciate in all this that Uh, There are many who have been supporting us in these uh, leaner attended days, and uh, we are um, buoyed by your generous hearts. At this time, uh, we'll be seated for a few moments uh, for the voluntary that we might meditate upon the sermon that we've heard. Friends, there are a number of people listed in our prayers today, and we will be praying for each one. Uh, We, uh, at this time, go to prayer, and so let us rise at this time for prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, you do present our minds with things that our minds cannot comprehend, and we thank you for entrusting those things to our stewardship, and then carrying the burden of them by the wisdom of your Holy Spirit, by the faithfulness of Christ, by the fatherly loving care of you, Heavenly Father. And so bless us, dear Lord, in all of life. Help us, dear Lord, never to think it was because of us, but because of your love, that we actually could this week say, all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you, O Lord, are interested in me. Thank you for such a love, such a grace, such a kindness, for an eternal commitment that you have made to us. Lord, in your mercy, Uh, hear, dear Lord, the prayers of those who cry to you, and we ask, O Lord, your blessing upon uh, those who celebrate, namely Lori Holt, her baptismal birthday, and Thomas L. Pumphrey, the same. We ask your blessing on these as they live out that which you designed for them and have given as the greatest gift in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, be we pray uh, with Donna Holt who successfully received a new lung, who is slated to return home on Tuesday, who is recuperating well, and all of which we give you thanks. Be also with Tony Rogal, Liza Wolf, Jennifer Cavey, Inga Donnelly, all who are affected either by having contracted the coronavirus or those who are caring for them, or those who are finding times of depression and other forms of illness with which they deal. Be also with the homebound, with Arliss and Donald and Debbie and Mel, 
Ruth, Janie, Denise, and Sandra. We also pray that you will help those who have specific and personal need for each of us according to our need and also in similar way for John, Bridget, and James. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for our police, for fire department, for the National Guard, for the military. Please protect them. Bless that their mission may be pure and that may help society in retaining a godly order and a social righteousness. Be with their families as at times their minds run away with them. And sometimes even for good reason. But Lord, you're in charge. And help us to find a simple peace and rest in your loving care. Be with Wayne Jacob. Be with uh, Matthew, with Alex. Uh, be with Candy. Be, we pray, with those in Venezuela. Help our world, dear Lord, to find peace. And in doing so, we ask that you would bless the work of missionaries who, while lethal weapons of this earth, will accomplish a truce or a strong peace because of might, that where it is not by might, but may be by your spirit, hearts will be changed inside in our country and in the countries of the world and find a greater peace. Lord, in your mercy. For this and all other things, we trust you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those not communing with us today, we continue with our salutation and through the final hymn. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Our final hymn, hymn 805, the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. God from whom all blessings flow. 